Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over UFC Toronto for this Saturday, and this is going to be DFS uh, video number one. Uh, as you guys hopefully know by now, we break the DFS analysis down into two separate and distinct portions. One, uh, going over the plays, like who the best actual DFS plays are, and then the second video is going to be completely focused on sort of advanced lineup construction. Uh, I feel as though it, it's worth uh, making that distinction, and I don't think enough people do it. And uh, it's the way I think about MMA DFS. And I think that it's going to be, it's going to continue to be very instructive. Um, and I, I hate to um, belittle the, you know, the, the giving of the plays, right? And I like to say that oh, it's not, it's not difficult to come up with good plays and it sort of isn't. Okay. Um, and, but yes, if you don't know anything, then, you know, you, you need some help. It, it, I do want to go over that with you. But it's so much more important to figure out how those plays work well together in lineups and how those plays work well, uh, given certain ownership constraints and depending on what type of tournament you're playing, et cetera. So uh, we are going to break it down into to two uh, to two videos. So this one's going to be video one, uh, just called the plays, I suppose. All right. Um, so we're going to go through, uh, uh, I guess, right from the bottom of the card here. And we're going to get right into a very instructive fight right off the bat. So you have Malcolm Gordon versus Jimmy Flick. And you have incredible line movement that occurred after Bryson. You have Malcolm Gordon, who is 8,300, which basically implies maybe like a minus 120 uh, money line. But all this money came in in the last couple of days, bringing him to minus 220. So essentially, if they repriced everything now, he would be about 8,800. So there's an incredible amount of line value in Malcolm Gordon, making him kind of a theoretical lock. Okay, That doesn't mean you have to play him, but um, these are the things that we look for is complete misprices. And that's what we have here. And again, you know, if you go through uh, MMA Twitter or whatever, I mean, you'll see people just say, oh, my God, how can Malcolm Gordon be minus 200? It's like ridiculous. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that's, that's not – for us to argue when we do DFS analysis, that's kind of, you know, if you don't believe you should be two to one, you know what, and bet, bet, what's his name in the bet flick in the money line. Okay. But when it comes to DFS, you have to at least start with the presumption that the money line is accurate. So you do have a mispriced fighter uh, in Malcolm Gordon, and he's going to show up as a good play. Now it would be even better if you also had a good inside the distance line. So let's just take a look at it. Malcolm Gordon inside the distance is minus 130. I mean, it really just doesn't get any better than this from a, from a pure math perspective. Okay. This inside the distance line is befitting of a 91, $9,200 fighter, and he is 8,300. Uh, and he's just a complete smash play. Now, uh, that is not the end of the story, though, you know, because this is one of my one of my main tenets of betting MMA, uh, especially when you have complete direct leverage, like one against the other, is that if you can identify the easiest and best play to make, it's really important because that means that everybody else is going to identify that as well. And if you can play his opponent, provided the opponent is reasonable, that opponent given the amount of leverage you're going to get is is almost equally, if not as good of a play, if not better than, than the smash play. So Jimmy Flick, we have to take a look at because yes, his money line's awful. Okay. Um, he's priced as if he's about to pick him and he's a two to one underdog. Um, but let's take a look at the inside the distance line flick inside the distance is plus three twenty, And unfortunately that's like really atrocious. Okay. That's like really bad given the um given his price. I mean, that should be something befitting of a, you know, of a, of a seventy-two hundred dollar fight. So he's really just an awful play. And that's a shame because you you'd love to get leverage against Gordon, but you have to at least have him be a reasonable play to make this. And uh um so for me, uh again, uh, I think Malcolm Gordon easily rates as the best play, best DFS play on. Well, we'll talk about on the slate in a minute, but I mean, how, how do you not play this? Well, I mean, you don't play it because he's going to be 50% owned. And yes, you can make that argument that, that you can get leverage, but you better 
first of all, find an $8,300 fighter that has a reasonable chance of, of outscoring him, right? That would be awesome. MMA is ripe with variants, so um, you could find it. Um, or find a way to play flick, because that's where you get your direct leverage. Just the metrics are just really, really poor for him. So we're going to start with the easy play. And I mentioned this is you know sometimes not difficult to find good plays. So Malcolm Gordon, right off the bat, probably the best play on the slate. Um, well, with the exception of the main event, which we'll get to a little later. Jasmine uh, Jodavisis versus Pat Pris Priscilla Cachuera. So you have a very, very difficult price. You know, you have 9,500 versus 6,700. And when you look at the money line, first of all, I mean, it's it's fair, but we've seen, we've seen uh, fighters at that price be like 10 to 1 or 8 to 1 or something like that. Minus 4 to 1 is not that great for a $9,600 fighter, especially when I mean, to, for 9600 to pay off, she's going to need, you know, it's not even enough to get a finish. You know, you, she's got to get a finish with either really early, like in the first minute, or accompanied by a shitload of takedowns and control time. Now, uh, fortunately, it's a matchup where she might be able to do that because um, Priscilla Cachuera is, is very, very poor off of her back. But remember, for, for Jazz the Vicious to smash enough to get there at 9,600, you need the following parlay. You need her number one to go for the wrestling-based approach. Number two, have it work. And then number three, have it work well enough. Okay, so the first thing is really out of your analysis is whether she's even going to go for that. Now, you you think as, as, an, as, an, as someone who analyzed these fights that, that she should, because right? she probably should. But these fighters come up with strange game plans sometimes. And J Jazz the Vicious very well might, you know, just try to test her striking here. I mean, I just, I just don't know. Just because we think that her easiest path to victory is to get, you know, get takedowns and whatever. I mean, maybe, just maybe she tries to get into a striking battle here. And I'll tell you this, that's just not the way to win this fight. Okay. And it's certainly not the way to smash at 9,500. Okay. Um, so I think that she's actually a pretty poor play at that price. Um, now, again, can she do it? Sure. But remember, for her to get like the 130 or so she's going to need, she needs like multiple takedowns and, and multiple rep minutes of control time ending in a submission, you know. And, and Cachuera, you could argue that if, if her – takedown defense is that bad, then she's not even going to be able to get up enough to let Jasmine get the multiple takedowns. So um, now with that said, Cachuera did give up quite a, quite a number to, um, to Maverick in their last start. Uh, it was like literally the perfect scenario. She, she gave up a takedown, I think every single round and hung around all the way through round three. <laughs> so it means a lot of control time and, and gave up the submission at the end of the day. So that was like, that's how the $9,600 fighters get there. Third, with, with that, with wrestling, third round submissions, but it's got to be almost exactly like that. So um, anyway, I, I don't think she rates as a particularly good play. I'll get to her in MME maybe, but uh, what about Cachuera? I mean, she's, she's only plus 300. It's not that bad. And I'll tell you this, if she's going to win, I mean, she puts up a lot of volume. She gets really hard. She's going to probably score pretty well if, in fact, she does win the 25% of the time. Um, I don't know if Judith Chastavicious is going to be popular enough to give me the, the leverage I need, but I certainly am going to play her in some in some GPP stuff uh, in, in, in the 150s. All right. Uh, Johan Lanise Leoness versus Sam Patterson. So you have minus 150 plus 120. So let's just double check the money line here. Yeah, this is about what he's supposed to be. Maybe he should be a little higher laying it. So maybe it's a little line value, but not much. And then you have a weird situation because you look at the inside the distance line, you have laying as inside the distance, like minus 120. And that's like awesome. I mean, that's like really, really good. But what, I, what I'm hearing is that he's low volume and he's not as aggressive as he used to be. So what, what do you believe? I mean, do you believe the narrative or do you believe 
the number. I mean, for my money, I prefer to uh, to believe the number. Okay, so uh, Leonez, uh in Canada. You know, like I'm sure he's going to bring more volume than he has been whatever in front of his home fans. I wouldn't worry too much about that. I just see this inside the distance line. It's like really, really strong. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna I think it's a very, very good play. Um, and Patterson on the other side. Uh, had a weird bunch of inside the distance lines here. They want, you can only get plus plus one forty five, but here you get like plus four fifty. So we're going to go with this one. Uh, and, and, and render Patterson is probably a very, very poor play. So as you can see already, this is where we're headed. You know, we're headed for these middling bills. We're going to get to these, you know, to the, to the main event, for example, and this is going to be what ends up being the best plays and the most logical type of lineups. Do we have to play them? No, but, but this is where we're headed already, it seems. Uh, Jillian Robertson versus Pollyanna Vienna. So she is, Jillian Robertson is 9,100, I believe, something like that. Yep. So she should be, you know, again, probably minus 300 favorite, uh, at least minus 250. Yeah, minus 300, money line's good. But at 9,200, remember what you need. You need, you need to have a, inside the distance line of minus 110 uh, for openers. Not only that, I mean, you know, she, it's not just to get it in that second round. We'd love to get it in the first round. Let's just see. Jillian Robertson's inside the distance line is minus, here it's like minus 130, so it rings out to minus 110. So it's about about a pick them. Yeah, fair enough. That, that That's fair enough. Uh, and she does have takedown upside as well. Pollyanna Viana doesn't really defend takedowns too well. And Julie Robertson would prefer to be on top in this uh, in this situation. So, uh, yeah, perfectly reasonable favorite. Viana on the other side, very, very thin inside the distance line. I was expecting to get a little, I expect to be a little, you know, stronger than plus 350, plus 400. So I just, you know, she could certainly get there. Um, and, if, and if Robertson is, particularly popular and you could try it, but I, I don't think you, you know, I don't think beyond is a priority play at all. So we'll put, we'll put Roberts in as our first kind of decent favorite. And then we'll just proceed from there. Um, so this one's really weird. This, this Serhi Saidi versus Ramon Tavares. It's, it's a, it's a weird rematch. Like these guys fought before and it was kind of an even fight, and then and then Severa knocked him down, or what's his name? Uh, Sidey knocked him down, and the referee stopped the fight a little bit too fast. So they gave Sidey the win, but you know eventually uh, they, they said it was a lot of controversy. So they figured they would run it back. So I guess the first thing we should think about is what the, what the line was that first time, right? So the first time Sidey was like plus one fifty five, I guess. I mean minus one fifty five. Let's go. Let's go back. Actually, let's see. Yeah, Saidi was 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 minus one eighty plus one fifty five. Today it's the same. Nothing's really changed there. Um, as far as the 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 pricing goes, doesn't seem like there's any real value there either. So we're just analyzing these things just by the virtue of their inside the distance line. So you have. Sidey should be, if you want to play, I'm probably like plus 110 inside the distance. So let's just take a look. Plus 110, is that what we're after here? Sidey inside, plus one. Well, here's my, some weird lines here. Where Where is this? Betway? Plus 140, maybe? Yeah, if you want sighting inside the distance, yeah, you're like plus 130 or so. Um, reasonable. Not the best, but but reasonable. And then on the other side, this one is actually pretty interesting. You have Tavares. It's like plus 175. That's like incredibly strong for this price tag. This is a very, very strong underdog play. So, so yeah. So as far as the plays, this is, you know, this is really, really good. Um, so Saidi, just okay. Tavera is extremely strong. 
All right. Uh, Sean Woodson versus Cla uh, Charles Jordan. Uh, minus 200 versus plus 180. So I'm expecting, again, about 9K, something like that. And that's what we have, 9K, 7,200. So again, for 9K and up, we want, you know, minus 110 inside the distance, as far as it's inside the distance line. It's not much of a grappler, necessarily. Um, and I don't imagine this is going to fly. Yeah, as you have Jordan inside the distance is plus 160 or so. That's just really not very good. You have Woodson inside the plus 450. It's going to probably be a boxing match and, and, uh, I think this fight is probably pretty close to a fade. So I'm going to probably fade this whole thing. Uh, Brad Katona versus Garrett Armfield. You have 8,800, 7,400. Another one which should be, you know, a money line of about plus 180, something like that. Yep, about that, minus 200. So let's take a look. I mean, uh, just take a look at the metrics here. Uh, Katona does have some wrestling, so we have to give him a little bit of an edge for that. But aside from that, uh, Katona inside the distance is plus two. 20 ah not not great uh arm field inside the distance plus like 400 also not great so unless you really generate a lot of points from the katona takedown exhibition i think you're i think this fight's kind of a lemon you know and and you see two fights where he went for takedowns one of them he lost see if you get this one this is this is fine and obviously gets on top at a billion strikes. And even that's only 93. Yeah, I think this fight from a GPP perspective is probably a lemon. So uh, I wouldn't consider either of these priorities. Uh, Evloev versus Arnold Allen. You have 8,700 versus uh, 7,500. Take a look at the money line here. You have, you know, about pretty reasonable. Evloev minus 200. I mean, you, you could have made the case to make him 9K, but... So maybe there's a little bit of 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 uh, of money line value here, uh, which is which is listen that that adds up. So we'll put him in for now. And then the thing is, is that this is going to be one of those fights where, for Evloev's from Evloev's point of view, it's not really about the inside the distance line because his style is very heavy, very wrestling heavy. Let's take a look. Evloev inside the distance, you see, it's like plus you know six hundred. That's just not what he does. Um. Allen inside the distance, for example, he's like plus 370, which is he's more likely to finish than Evloeb, but that doesn't mean he's more likely to get more fantasy points because Evloeb can rack up like a bunch of takedowns. So, like, for example, let's take a look at some of his recent ones here. Four, nine, nine, two, nine minutes of control time. Against, by the way, I mean, Lopes is freaking a stud, okay? Um, seven minutes of control time. It's Ige, 10 minutes, five minutes, you know, uh, 12 minutes over here. So if Allen could get taken down, I mean, this could be a smothering, you know, and, and over three rounds, you get like one takedown per, even only one takedown per round and four, you know, what, 10 minutes of control time. I mean, that's going to more than pay off the 8,700. So I think he's really, really strong here. Uh, Allen, a um, couple of things going against him and his money line is pretty, is, is kind of fishy. His inside the distance line is kind of fishy, like plus 350, plus 400. You know, he, if you if you wanted, you know, to play him at seventy five hundred, you just got to have a little bit better shot to finish. So I think this one is going to be favorite or pass. And that would be Evloev. All right, uh, Chris Curtis versus Mark Andre Barrio. All right, this is again, this is a fight where you really can go crazy, kind of overanalyzing this. Um, so let's just go right to the numbers. It's just easier that way. Uh, Curtis, 8,500, he should be about, what, minus 160? Let's take a look. Um, are we going to get this, Olberg and Reyes? If so, I don't have, I don't have a, well, I don't have a salary for this yet. If this, this in fact, does make it to the card, by the way, I mean, Olberg is probably going to be 9,300, right? I mean, he's probably going to have a big inside the distance line. Dominic Reyes is going to get blitzed in this fight, right? I mean, he hasn't. I don't know. Anyway, I, I don't imagine we. I shouldn't say I don't imagine. I honestly don't know if we're going to. It's going to be part of the DFS thing. 
If so, I don't know why this, if not, I don't know why this is on. Anyway, Chris Curtis, yeah, minus 180, plus 155, sounds about right. Uh, if anything, maybe Chris Curtis is a little bit of line value. But let's just take a look at the inside of distance lines. This is going to be a striking-based fight. So when you have a striking-based fight, the only way to really get there is with a lot of volume or with, you know, with with a, with a, with a finish. And I'll tell you, neither – well, let's first start with Curtis. I mean, plus 200, plus 220 inside. I mean, not great. Um, Mark Andre Burial, plus 300 inside. I mean, that's, I guess, okay. At 7,700, though, it's not great. And there's no wrestling upside. You know, so on the numbers, this fight seems like one you're supposed to fade. But I just have this vision of these guys just swaying after each other and somebody going down. You know, Burial brings all kinds of pressure. He doesn't give an F about getting hit, you know, and Curtis is a big counter puncher. I'm probably going to get to this fight on both sides just because of that. You know, I just, I just feel they're both going to be swinging and someone's going to get clipped, you know? And, and uh, so I'm going to probably get over the field on this, uh, on this fight. And it really doesn't have much to do with the numbers. It's because the numbers dictate that, they're really not going to finish all too often, but I just kind of see with all this volume that's going to be thrown up at both these guys, just someone's going to get smashed. So that's that's my that's my take. Mike Malott versus uh, Neil Magny. All right, so to me, this is like probably this is probably the most uh, owned favorite, I imagine. And first of all, he's minus three fifty, big money line. And not only that, I mean, you look at his inside the distance line. It's like minus 200. That is by far the best inside the distance line. And even relative to his price, it's really strong. And you know what's, you know what's like kind of keeping, I want to keep his ownership down. What might keep his ownership down is that, you know, uh, Neil Magny does have, you know, he's been around forever. He's got a good reputation for making fights ugly. Okay. And this kind of vet lesson vig that's out there um might just might keep Malat's ownership a little lower than his you know than his regular metrics might uh, might indicate um so I, I'm I don't like uh well I shouldn't say I don't like Magni because we have we do have to look at his inside the distance line because if in fact Malat does come in really popular then we could should consider the leverage but like I said Magni's got to at least show something and his inside the distance line is like plus 900 which is like a disaster so um uh so that's that fight so we're at the last two fights which are both five round fights um and um remember five round fights tend to score more because they have five rounds to work with so if you don't get that you know that finish uh you have more rounds number first of all you know more rounds to get the finish and number Two, you have more rounds to just rack up points in general. Like winning a five round decision is just going to score just, you know, what, 60% more, I guess, than winning a three round decision on average. Um, so these fights have to be respected. One thing to think about with these five round fights is how much the additional two rounds is going to help a particular fighter. You know, because this happens a lot. Like we have these big heavyweights that, uh, that go after each other and they schedule them for five round championship fights. But it's the, the fight is like my, it's about minus 200 to finish in the first two rounds. So, I mean, what's the point? You know what I mean? Like what's the point in analyzing it for a five round fight if it's going to finish in the first two rounds anyway. So, um, so it's important to make that distinction, but you, you have this first fight, like, like Pennington, Bueno, Bear, uh, Marina, Bu Maria, Mariah Myra Bueno Silva. Sorry. Um, well, first look at the numbers. I mean, she's minus 160. So you expect her to be what, 8,600 or so? Sounds about right. And for an $8,600 fighter, she's going to need to have an inside the distance line just, just straight up of about plus 200 or so. And you look at it, and her inside the distance line is like plus 110 or plus 130. So that's extremely strong, you know, not to mention the fact that, but the problem, not to mention that, the problem is, is that 
um, you know, inside the distance means that any time in the first five rounds, any time in the, in the five rounds, if she gets a fourth round finish, it's not exactly to be the same as far as scoring as a first or second round. Um, but the thing with Mary Buena Silva is that the, the five rounds don't help her as much, right? Because she has the strong inside the distance. I think that her inside the distance line would be very similar if this were only a three round fight. Okay. Maybe not. It's not going to be the same example as the heavyweights, but, but, but it's certainly worth, um, it's certainly worth, uh, worth discussing. Um, uh, uh, analyzing. Now, on the other hand, you have Raquel Pennington. Now, she has she has a very weak inside the distance line, I presume. Uh, I would say probably plus, plus a thousand. Let's just see. Yeah, sort of. Plus 900. But the thing is, is that means that most of her wins are going to be coming from decision by a, by a long shot. And what that means is she's going to be benefiting from those five rounds. Like Her score is going to be benefiting from an extra two rounds of clinch time of strikes and, and this, that, and the other thing. So it's kind of weird to say, but I think the five round helps Pennington score more than Buena Silva. Do I think that she's a better play? No, but, but I do think that she is playable. I mean, normally you would say, okay, plus 800 inside the distance, you're not going to play her, but her wins at in five rounds, given her price, is pretty reasonable. So I'm going to play. You just kind of have to play both sides of this fight. Um, uh, Buena Silva, you know, her side of the distance line is too strong. Plus, she does have five rounds, just in case, right? Um, but uh, so I think I would play both sides of this. Both both sides probably moderately. I wouldn't say aggressively, but moderately. Uh, the the, the the thing here is that this first the, is the main event is just to me on this card like almost impossible to fade okay and I'm the I'm the first one first one but I'm one of the first ones to advocate for you know fading the main event because of ownership and things like that but um I mean these guys are gonna bring it. I mean, Strickland is going to be bringing volume. He's going to be bringing the heat. Duplessis is going to be bringing the heat, you know, and, and someone's either going down or this is going to score through the roof in five rounds. I, I just can't see the winner not getting there. And, and the thing is, is that we've been through this card and it's just not a card filled with, with a whole bunch of scoring. You know, these guys were – these. these Fighters are pretty good for their price, but you don't have those those you know those ninety one hundred dollar fighters that are you know going to finish in the first round or anything like that. Like the closest thing we have to that is probably Malat, and then, then Jillian Robertson. You know what I mean? Like this is not the the card to fade. I don't think this fight. So they're both going to be extremely popular. Um. And I don't imagine being able to fade it. I, do I, I have no opinion on which one's better. Um, I guess I, I guess I do. I mean, see, how can you, how can you have an opinion on this? You have Duplessis is just, you know, he's, eh, he's got a similar inside the distance line. Maybe he's got a little bit more takedown upside. And Strickland's a little bit better money. I don't know. It's, it's, um, I guess Dupli Duplessis is sort of, maybe the better play i guess but not by a lot i mean i i would i would just jam this fight probably play 50 percent of each uh, and just be just be done with it i know it's chalky but i just it's just very very i don't know it just seems very unlikely that, that one of these guys with this hundred because that's what they're going to get i mean no one is winning this fight with less than 100 it's just not happening like this fight that strictly woman 95 is a complete aberration he won with five you know, because like Strickland, excuse me, that Asanya is all of his fights are where fantasy points go to die. You know, you give him five other rounds, it's going to look like this. It's going to look like this Imovov fight. You know, he's just score 118 in the decision. Right? That that's what's going to end up happening. Okay, if he wins the decision, or he can get a knockout at any point and probably pay off. Um, where Duplessis, I mean, he just brings all kinds of heat every round, and I don't know. So for me. I guess it's overall a pretty chalky slate, you know, 
And that doesn't mean we have to play this way because we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to talk about lineup builds in, in our other video, but Malcolm Gordon, just lock sort of uh, somebody from that. Uh, somebody from that Strickland fight is going to probably be a lock. Tavares is a really, really good underdog play. Uh, Evloev, good favorite. Leonez is good favorite. Rob Robertson, whatever. So, yes, you could play this exact lineup. Uh, here's a good example. If you play this exact lineup, you'll be duping it with 30, with at least 40 people, at least, I think. Uh, in any case, uh, that'll do it for the picks video. Uh, we will do a, a, a kind of an advanced lineup build uh, either later tonight or um, at some point between now and, and Saturday morning. Uh, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody.